I need to go because my thing's on. I'm just going to mute everyone there. Cool. So, um, hi everyone. If you haven't um, come on the uh, these sessions before, uh, my name's Ollie. I am from Creative Bloom, and I'll be running this session uh, for the majority of it. I will keep your microphones muted just because there is so much for us to get through in search marketing. We're going to be covering a load of stuff. Um, so. If everyone could have a look uh, for the chat function. So there's a chat function in Zoom and everyone just write hi in there for me because there'll be uh, one or two moments where I ask you to write in that box um, for some exercises and just so that you know where to ask some questions because Stu will be managing the chat for me. So if there's some questions he can quickly answer, he'll be able to fire them in there. Um, but if we have time at the end, fingers crossed, there'll be some questions um, some type of questions at the end. So, right, let's crack on. This is uh, webinar three from series two, um, search engine marketing. There's obviously four series uh, in this whole program. If you haven't uh, signed up for them uh, already, series three is now available on Eventbrite. So um, make sure you jump on there. It's gonna be all about systems and productivity. And we still have some more um, webinars from this series coming up. I think we have eight in total with a big QA session at the end. So yeah, make sure you jump on those if you get a chance. And just to mention, if you are not already aware, we have um, some free consultancy from Digital Champions um, from the Coast Capital Growth Hub. It's free digital support to drive small business success. Um, so you are able to take advantage of, um, I think there's eight people in total and they're offering eight hours of free specialist support, fully funded by Coast Capital Growth Hub. Um, and each individual digital champion offers a different type of skill. They have kind of a different blend of skills. So um, it would be a fantastic thing. There's literally no reason not to take advantage of it. And I know there are some people in this session who are the digital champions. So if you want to give the camera a wave, feel free to or say hi in the chat. Um, so there's obviously you're going to get all these slides and you'll be able to, to, to see them all in here. But we've got Andrew who deals with websites and CRMs, uh, Malcolm for e-commerce, uh, Lisa for digital tech and improving productivity and processes, Rachel, our SEO expert um, for support with marketing plans and tactical activity advice. And we've got Rob who deals with digital transformation, Susan who uh, works uh, digitally focusing uh, products and services, and Roya, uh, if you want to utilize digital to accelerate the growth of your business. So um, there is a form at the end of this uh, of these slides. So if you do want to get in touch with them, um, I'll show you how to do it at the end of, just to remind you at the end of this presentation. So this is search engine marketing. And what we'll be covering is, you'll see a lot of cats, because I love cats and they kind of uh, help uh, lighten up what is like a lot of information to take in. So hopefully we're all a fan of some nice little cat illustrations. Um, but search engine marketing is basically comprising of um, two main areas. So that's SEO, which is search engine optimization and PPC, which is uh, essentially paid advertising. And in and around there, we've got loads of things that we're gonna be focusing on. So this is a rough itinerary of what we're gonna be covering, how Google works, the factors that affect SEO. We'll touch on keywords, um, the things you need to have on your website, on pages, and how you need to optimize those pages for SEO and what you can do. Some notable mentions that I always like to throw in so that everyone um, can go away and do some action straight away just to check how their website's doing. Um, and then we'll jump on to um, AdWords. We're focusing on search and display advertising. That's what I'll be talking about today. There, will, there is shopping and other things, but we're going to focus on those today. We'll, I'll give you a very top level understanding of how it all works, a bit around keyword research. Um, I'll mention remarketing and reporting as well. So when we're talking about search marketing, we're, we're talking about the landscape that is on a search engine. And we're talking about people getting yourself found on, and we're gonna obviously focus on Google, other search engine um, platforms are available. Um, we're going to be talking about Google uh, and we're going to be kind of differentiating between SEO and paid advertising. And, and we're obviously probably all familiar with what a Google, my, uh, Google search uh, results page looks like, a little bit like this. We typically have ads at the top and then organic underneath. But one thing that's really important is this very often changes 
depending on what you're searching for, the whole environment will look different. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot of kind of analyzing what's going on um, for each sector and different kind of search engines. So the first thing I'd like you to do is I'd like everyone to find the chat and imagine it's Google. And I'd like you to type into that chat what you would search for in Google if you wanted an occasion cake made for you. That's all the information I'm going to give you. And I'd like everyone to <laughs> cheers to you, Judy's cake. But um, yeah, type into the chat what it is that you would search for if you were going onto Google to um, search for an occasion cake made for you. And I'll just give you just a couple seconds. Perfect. Okay, brilliant, thank you very much. So this is, this is an exercise I really love doing because it's, and it's something everyone should really be doing for their sector and their service. You know, whatever you do, um, people very typically will go into Google and they'll type in a keyword that they think um, uh, is the right one to find what they're looking for, right? Now, I've just asked kind of however many of you are in here, the same question. I've asked you to, to type in the say just to, to type in what you type in if you wanted an occasion cake made for you. And pretty much everyone has typed in something different. And this is a really important thing to remember when we're talking about SEO, because we know so much about our businesses. We know what we do. We know, right, you know, um, you know, we know, you know, I we do digital marketing. So that's surely what someone's going to type in. But this exercise, and you can do it, like I say, for your own business and your own sector, this is a perfect example of how people don't necessarily type in what they think, what you think they do. And the keyword that you think you should be targeting might not be the correct one. Um, and doing this exercise reminds us that people use all sorts of different varieties of keywords. Some people use locations in there um, if we're searching for something in a specific um, you know, lo local area. Uh, some people replace the word, uh, you know, cake with patisserie. Some people use suddenly birthday cakes. And all of these different um, topics and queries are things that you should think around your content. You know, do I have content around that on my website? Because if you don't, you know, if you don't have the words occasion cakes or, you know, cakes for occasions, that kind of thing, you're probably not going to appear for those search terms. So doing this exercise, asking some people to, to um, type in what they would search for for your business will help kind of pull out some. It's a really great way of just doing a bit of research with either people you know or people that don't know your business. So when we talk about search engine optimization and after doing that little exercise, um, we're going to say that it's all about optimizing signals both on and off a website to get it to show up when people search. Okay. And what is the important, after doing that exercise, what's the important word in that sentence? Optimizing signals both on and off a website to get it to show up your website when people search any ideas what the what the key word is in there after just doing that exercise that we just did any takers anyone want to jump in there and write in the chat give you give you five seconds the key word in that sentence is people and it's because we've just learned that people all think differently. They're all at different stages of the funnel. They're all typing something different. So we can optimize all these things. But the one thing that we need to really focus on and be flexible around is people. How are they searching? What are they thinking? Why are they searching? You know, how are they exploring the website and all these things? And, and all of the, the elements that we're going to cover are going to um, kind of help with SEO, but it's all going to be kind of focused around, you know, why people are doing it. There's a big red arrow there if you, if you haven't seen it already. Okay, very simply, how do search engines work? So firstly, search engines are looking for, for authority, very top level. So this is making sure that you're an authority in your sector, um, you know, websites that have had more traffic through them. They've got a lot more data around how people are browsing. They have more backlinks. We'll talk about backlinks a bit later. Um, authority is a really important a measurement in terms of how um, well you'll rank for SEO. And it's a scale that's ranked from zero to 100. All new websites will start at zero. And most websites tend to sit on average around 20 or 30. And when we're talking about big websites like Amazon and eBay, we're talking like up in the hundreds, uh, sorry, up at 100. So Amazon, eBay, all those massive websites. Um, it's not something you should aim towards, but it's it helps. Uh, it's kind of an, in, it's indicative and it tells you how well you're doing it in general. So authority is number one thing. Number two, relevancy. 
you have to be relevant. And that means you really need to be honest and have a look at what's going on, the keywords and um, all the content that's out there and think, right, is my website really relevant? Have I included all the information I should? You know, have I kind of um, bothered to write, you know, e extra content on the website or have I just done essentially the bare minimum? Um, it's, it's really important. Google only wants to show results that are very, very relevant to the users because ultimately all Google cares about is giving everyone a good experience who's using the platform. So relevancy is too. And lastly, user experience. So the actual experience someone has on your website. So if you have lots of people coming onto the site and then suddenly leaving, okay, that's going to be assume, that's assume that's going to assume that that is a poor website experience. And so it's really important to make sure you're working on mobile optimization, making sure that in, in, in line with your competitors, you know, that you don't stand out for the wrong reasons, you know, was, did, is the website made 10 years ago and hasn't been updated, that kind of thing. So really paying attention to those three things. Um, yeah, Alison, as you said, I'll, I'll talk about how we can influence authority a little bit later. So, and very simply, how Google crawls the web, there is something called a Google spider. Um, I always say that this might be a better depiction of what it maybe looks like, but um, we'll leave that for now. There is a Google spider who uses the Google algorithm to crawl the web. And it's basically just trying to um, take in all the websites out there, all the content, categorize it, and get a good understand understanding for what's going on. And then from that, it's gonna make a decision around who should rank where for what terms. Um, okay. So if you don't know already, uh, the question, what will SEO help with? So what will SEO help with? It will help you get found organically, nationally or locally. So it gets you found when we say organic, that means without paying for it. So that means appearing in the Google search results because you've, um, got good relevancy, authority and that kind of thing. So ranking well. Help uh, improving your SEO can also reduce the cost of ad campaigns. So when we're talking about PPC later on, that is all about optimization and relevancy as well. So the more optimized your account is, um, sorry, the more optimized and relevant your website is, the less you'll have to pay um, per click for your advertising. So it's gonna help reduce the cost of that. Of course, it's gonna increase conversions because you're gonna get more people through the website. You're going to get more um, qualified users who are um, typing in exactly what you want to rank for. So having the right content helps you increase conversions. And of course, the all important stat is defeating your competitors, because that's really what we all want to do. And like I say, we focus on Google, but there are a lot of other search engines available. Um, and it's always interesting as well to do some searches on these other search engines, particularly Bing. You know, Ecosia is one that's coming up a little bit more and see how you're ranking on there compared to Google. You know, is there anything that, um, is there any kind of extra feature of those search engines that we can jump on? Okay, so let's uh, do a quick search on Google. Uh, Stu, can you see, everyone see my screen okay? I think so, yep, nod, okay, perfect, thank you. So let's, um, someone give me something to type into Google, into the chat, something to search for. So feel free to just throw it into, so dogs. Okay, let's do, okay, I'll take dogs and we'll say um, dog sitters. How about that? I'll do dog sitters. All right, perfect. So dog sitters. So what's the first thing we see here? So the first thing we actually see is before we even look at the page, okay? And this is really important. We, we, we're very familiar with this environment, but let's really dive into each individual section, right? Even in these search results up here, right? What's Google doing? So Google is Google is suggesting keywords to me, but why is it suggesting these keywords? Any ideas? Feel free to throw it into the chat. What, what's, why would Google be suggesting dog sitters Brighton, dog sitters near me? We've got related searches, most used, similar, exactly. So yeah, so Google is essentially telling us, it's saying, okay, so you want dog sitters. Well, I'm just gonna tell you that most people are in your area because it's taking location in and previous searches, like you say, my, my search history. Um, it's taking into consideration the fact that we're in Brighton. So it's gonna include keywords around that, but also loads of people typically type in dog sitters in my area, dog sitters near me, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if I go back dog sitters, yeah. So it's giving me loads of locations, but what this is, is this is Google giving us some free keywords. It's saying, look, 
you need some content on this on your website if it's relevant to your service you should be including these uh these elements and for your sector you can do the same thing start tapping something in see what google presents you um with and you'll start to already own add some more keywords to your list okay so we've got some free keywords already and then firstly when we actually look down on the page we've got ads we're all familiar with um, we'll be talking about ads a little bit later google is also generating some c results about pet sitting and dog daycare so these it's linking these two and these are these widgets we'll talk about as well they they pop up a lot and more and more google is introducing new widgets for new sectors and it's important to look at those and think, right, can I get on those? You know, is there an opportunity? Sometimes it's going to be pulling in review websites. You know, if you're a restaurant, it might be pulling in um, a trip advisor and that kind of thing. You know, can you get your website on there? It might be pulling in blogs um, and directories. You know, are you, can you, can we kind of, is there a way we can get into there? Because if you can get yourself into these spots, you're immediately going to be, here you go, here's an example here. So we've got um, Bark and we've got hotels. You know, you could get a directory listing on one of these. Um, and immediately you're, you're way above the organic results without having to get your website ranking well. So when we're talking about search marketing, it's getting on here is, uh, um, and, and getting as much visibility as you can. So focusing on these new widgets that Google's introducing. This section here is for local SEO. So you won't see this when we're talking about um, national ranking nationally. This is this is focusing on local businesses and local areas. And you will only appear on this if you have a Google My Business page. And I'll be talking about that in a second. Um, so if you have a Google My Business page or if it's relevant to you, uh, that if, you're, if you're a business in a local area, does everyone have a Google My Business page in here? Because it's all about owning your space and, and appearing locally if you, if you offer a service in location. It's a, it's a really important um, thing to focus on if you, if you haven't got one already. We've got a people also ask section. So we can see here that it's pulling in um, a question and answers. Again, something that you can look at, you know, can you include some of this content on your website? Um, and then finally, after all of that, we're finally onto the organic results. Um, and another, another really valuable way to use a Google search results page in terms of looking at how can we improve our SEO by, by you doing this research is who is ranking well and why are they ranking well? You know, what are the consistencies between all of these page titles that are ranking well? Well, I can see that they all are including the word dog sitting. So this specific page, this page title is dog sitting in Brighton. And then the result number two is dog sitters in Brighton. And the next one is the best dog sitters in Hove, which is just like two minutes away from Brighton. So there is a there is a trend here. So if I had a page that did dog sitting, I would want to make sure that my page title is is somewhat in line and including the right types of keywords um, within my page title. And of course, we can see that some of them are pulling in reviews. Um, I have an absurdly long results page, but if you scroll right to the bottom as well, we also have some more free keywords. Private dog sitters. I hadn't thought of that keyword. That's something I'm going to include in my content now dog boarding, maybe a different type of word that people are using. So immediately, just from looking at this for five minutes, from my competitors and from Google's help, we've got loads more keywords that we can use, that we can implement into our kind of content strategies, um, look at our services, have we, you know, can we kind of expand things out a little bit and break down our services um, using some of these. Um, but yeah, immediately looking on your in your sector at your own results page and actually having a look at what's going on and who's ranking where and why um, is a really really important thing to to keep an eye on so very quickly owning your space so we talked about google my business page which this is a, this is really for local businesses in that serve a um service in location have a service in location business model however it's also relevant to think that even in your sector even if that isn't you a lot of Come, a lot of um, uh, people who might buy your products or your service, they might be comparing you versus your competitor, right? A lot of the time someone's typing in, they'll find your name somewhere. If you're doing Google ads, they'll find you and they'll type in your brand name and they'll look for reviews and they'll look for what you're about and how, you, how long you've been established for. And by owning your space and, and having a Google My Business page, it means you can immediately qualify, give them that, that positive trust signal. You can 
show them that you have almost five, you know, you've got five star reviews, that you've had a lot of reviews, that you that they can see real people talking about your product and how great you are. Um, you can show them pictures and all these types of things. And, and it also exists on Bing and Apple Maps as well. So, so making sure you own your space is really important um, in terms of customer retention, you know, taking customers from your competitors, making sure that um, you haven't just left this if you do have one. Let's say you don't have any reviews on it. You don't want it just to, just to be bare because that also could have a negative impact on how someone perceives your brand. So really paying attention to owning your space and claiming your Google My Business page. Um, just use the link in the chat if you need it. Prioritizing reviews. So when we're talking about search marketing, we're a lot of the time, especially on local map packs and, and when someone's doing a service and location uh, search, uh, we see reviews come up. There are, there are big big signal that makes someone subconsciously like one business over another. Even if there's no real, real rhyme or reason for it, we will click on something that has five stars over three stars. So having a, a review strategy is really important and making sure that whenever you've worked, on, worked with someone um, in any uh, capacity, that you followed it up with a review strategy, send them a review link and make sure you have Google reviews um, and also reviews on places where maybe your competitors do. You know, it, it, is it Yelp? Is it Facebook, TripAdvisor? Um, you know, do you need reviews on Trustpilot? That kind of thing, if it pulls it into the search results. Um, it's really important to encourage reviews. And we always try and recommend having at least 4.5 because again, subconsciously, as soon as someone drops below that, there's this feeling of, okay, why do they have, um, why do they have a lower score? And now they're, they're going to investigate a little bit further. So if you have dropped a little bit low, try and kind of get a few more reviews to kind of bump that up. But the big question, and in the chat, does anyone have an idea how many reviews you need? Very, very broad question. How many, what is the magic number of reviews? Or is it a trick question? The truth is you need more reviews than your competitors, of course. So if, if someone sees you in the map pack, if we look at these results here, Someone types in, you know, um, search and search marketing in Brighton or local SEO, whatever it is, and and these four results pop up. Most people in general are going to find the one with more reviews um, and also the higher review score. So very simply, try and get more than your competitors, and we always say prioritize Google first. Google now asks you to respond. So make sure you respond to your reviews. It actually prompts us to, and it sends you an email. And we always say, if Google suggests that you should do something, you should always try and do it. So, and, and that kind of exists um, primarily within the, the, the kind of Google and Bing space. If we're talking about Trustpilot and those kind of things, it, it maybe matters a little bit less, but with Google, make sure you respond. And just a, two seconds on negative reviews. And I think this is a really important um, thing to cover. We've worked with some businesses who, you know, have experienced a negative review and, uh, you know, someone's, someone's left them a review on Google that wasn't very nice. So what did they do? They jumped straight in to reply to them, telling them how horrible that, that review is and how dare they write such a horrible thing about their product and their product is the best and all this kind of thing. But what you need to remember is any response that you give is not for that person. It is for everyone else. It's for every other customer so that they can see how you deal with this process. You know, give them a contact information, make sure you reach out. It's all about kind of, you know, when we're talking about the search environment, it's about making sure wherever someone sees you, you are, your brand is on point. You know, everything on there is um, a cohesive and has the same branding. The language is the same. You deal with customers really well. You deal with complaints really well. So really, really, really important to, uh, um, not be a cyber bully and don't get into a war, you know, take it offline um, as most of us are aware of. And if you don't know where to um, get that URL from for your review strategy and Google My Business page, there's a little kind of instruction there in terms of where to do it. And you can send someone a nice short link asking them to review you. Okay, that's about owning your space. Now we're gonna talk about websites. So your website is a signpost. So Google is gonna come into your website. And what we want is we want our content and everything laid out in a way that's easy to understand, okay? This particular website here, if it looked like this, it would be kind of confusing. It doesn't wanna kind of come down. It doesn't wanna, you know, 
if we talk about a 404 page, which is a broken page, for example, you know, that is, that's going to impact your SEO if you have a lot of pages that are broken because it's like a dead end to Google. It's like Google coming to your website, going down a road and there being nothing there. And then it being like, right, where do I go from here? So making sure that you look, you know, go through your website, understand your site structure and how, why you've set things up how you have. You know, is it easy for a user to navigate? If it is, it's probably easy for, for Google to navigate. But keeping an eye on what's going on and making sure that kind of all the different kind of roads and routes through your website are kind of slick and um, there aren't loads of basically technical issues. And why does Google rank one website over the other? Is it because someone is just shouting, I am amazing and just talking about themselves? Um, no, it's not. Um, is it because someone's shouting loud about how amazing they are and how great they are? It's also not that either. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to consider and we need to think about the customer and the content and all that stuff in order to rank. And really, we want to focus on these three areas, which is expertise, authority and trust. So we talked about authority before, but when we're looking at our content um, and obviously review signals as well, Google wants us to see, Google wants to see that we're an expert in our sector. Okay, there was an update um, that Google made about a year ago called the EAT update. And it's all about expertise, authority and trust. And what that means is when you're talking about expertise, no, it's not, it's not anymore about how long a website's been around or kind of um, necessarily just about how many backlinks. It's a, a whole kind of um, combination of different things that gives kind of newer websites and smaller websites a bigger chance to a bigger opportunity to rank you know if you've written your content really well if this what that's why when we're seeing kind of all these resource guides they're so long now and they and they're like packed full of information because it's all about giving people the, as much value as possible um so making sure that when we're looking at our website content we're going to be focusing on being an expert in our sector so in the content making sure we're giving people loads of information that stuff we're going to, you know, authority. So over time, you know, building up our trust signals in terms of getting links to our website from other websites, um, in, improving our reviews, um, when people come through our website, have a good experience and all those things, they're all going to be super important. And it's really important to be honest with yourself. So look at your own website and think, right, does my website deserve to rank? Let's be honest. Let's look through the competitors and let's see if there's anyone out there, you know, who am I competing with and what kind of experience do you have on their website? You know, when I come to mine or when, when you come to your website, does someone have a better experience the same? Is it worse? Is the content um, a little bit uh, less? Have I gone into as much detail and that kind of thing? Really important to try and be honest with yourself um, and just step back. And when you're looking at your content, think, what do I need in my sector? What are my pages? What types of content from this do I need? Do I need blogs? Do I need, you know, photos, videos? And the answer is every single sector is different. So the websites that are ranking well for particular keywords, depending on the sector, they all have a different kind of combination of these things. If we're talking about the healthcare sector, it's going to be mainly text. It's going to be mainly content. You know, maybe there would be some um you know infographics on there but there's not going to be necessarily loads of imagery pictures um it's not going to be blogs necessarily it's going to be more kind of resource guides pdf downloads whereas if we're talking about a wedding flower company that's going to be full of photos and imagery and um yeah maybe articles and stuff but it's important to understand in your sector what you need and this is always changing as well so you know video might suddenly increase and it might be a good idea to start trying to do some video content um, but paying attention to your sector and, and what's actually going on um, that's a really good idea and when we talk about content in general unique content is king it's all about unique content you know the web was built off people writing things um, and you know new websites popping up so making sure that you're you know when you're writing something, writing it uniquely. You know, if you're trying to take um, elements from somewhere else, um, or even if you're trying to kind of cite paragraphs, just really try and take that into consideration that you need to write it uniquely and try and provide value, like more value than someone else's. And when we're looking at our website, when we're talking about content, um, we need to ask the question, what should you write about? Like, what should we write about? And again, 
if we're looking at from our business from an inside out perspective, we think we know what the services that we do are and we think we know what the customer needs. But it's as that exercise showed us earlier, you know, we might think that someone's searching one way, but essentially there could be loads of other things that they might need us to write about. There could be loads of other content out there that would actually bring in customers that we otherwise wouldn't know. So um, this is where we do our research. And there's loads of research that we can do. So we can do our search research, like what we just did, call it search research, it's quite nice, um, has a ring to it. Um, but like what we just did, looking at the environment, what's going on, you know, is it just organic results? Do I need to write loads of blogs? What's popping up here? You know, change the keyword a little bit and type it in, but have a look for your sector, what's going on and what opportunities are there uh, for me to rank highly? So, you know, look at your competitors, look at the keywords that are coming up. What keywords does Google suggest? What little widgets are popping up? Um, you know, you can now book flights through Google. You can book hotel rooms. You can do so much and that will keep changing and the search environment is going to continue to be focused around Google and Google essentially will, would rather someone just stayed on their platform and didn't even click on your website. So paying attention to this as much as you can as it changes is, is really important. So man says, when you say content, should, 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 be, should it be relevant keywords? Do we always write content in the form of blogs or is there something else that makes a difference too apart from page headings? Yeah, so I'm gonna go through content now. So we're gonna talk about where the keywords should go and hopefully that'll answer the question, Saman. So when we're talking about research, we've got search research. So that is just doing some searching on Google or other search engines. Um, then we've got keyword research. And this is actually picking out the exact keywords and getting some volumes and getting some data around what are people searching for. Um, without keyword research, we're, we're essentially just stumbling around in the dark thinking, okay, this is what someone's searching for. This is what my customer is typing in. But it may change over time, you know, the, the whole environment. And I'll give you an example about where it's changed for us very recently with a client of ours. But the three that I've highlighted here are all free. Google Keyword Planner, Bing Keyword Planner and Google, Google Trends. So these two here, I'll show you a screenshot of what it looks like. But essentially, you can plug in a keyword and it will sh send you out loads and loads of keywords related to that keyword that people type in. And it will give you an idea of search volumes and how competitive they are. So immediately, immediately you've got an, a huge bank of stuff that people have um, uh, people are searching for that you maybe didn't realize. Um, if you these are really uh, designed for paid advertising, and they will ask you for a credit card when you if you haven't uh, got an account yet, but they won't charge you. They'll just send you some pretty hundred pound free vouchers, which I'm about to I'll, I'll, I'm telling off a little bit later. So. Um, they won't charge you anything, but just be just be wary that they will ask for some card details. And then Google Trends is another free one where where it's a really good tool to compare keywords. So if you find two and you don't know if one's trending up, one's trending down, um, it will help you there. There are some paid up paid tools as well that are available. And when we're thinking about keyword research, you know, as you might have, as you will have experienced in some of the other uh, webinars that have already run. Um, Depending on the, the, the buying stage, you know, whether someone's at a different stage of the buying process or they're just trying to, you know, discover, you know, what it is they're looking for, or they know what they want to buy, um, they're going to be typing in something different. So, for example, if someone's at the awareness stage and they want to improve their garden, they're looking outside of their garden, they're thinking, you know what, I'd like to improve my garden. They might type in something like that. If they've already decided they want to kind of improve their garden um, and they're trying to work out, right, what should I do to improve it? That suddenly the, the keyword changes to how much does a gardener cost? And then if they're suddenly at the stage where they know how much it costs and now they're looking for one, they might type in something like best gardener and Brian. So, but for your service, the keywords intent will change depending on the stage at which someone is along that process. So trying to, trying to do a little bit of work on that you know, what, how do the keywords change and how does my content fit around that? You know, and yes, you can just write a blog on these things, you know, um, for example, Best Gardener in Brighton. I could write a blog now if I had um, a like horticultural website talking about the best five gardeners in Brighton for 2021. And I just kind of give as much information and value as I can. Um, and then, you know, you might find in, you know, a couple months that starts ranking well for, for those keywords. So, um, yeah, different stages, really important. This is a little snapshot of G Google Keyword Planner. So this is an example of what you might see. 
Um, you would type in a keyword up here. So I've typed in Glasgow bag bagpipes, as you do. Um, and in and when, when you press search up here, you can specify the you know location you want to search in. It will generate for you loads of keywords related to your search term up here. It will give you the average monthly searches and it will tell you how competitive they are. So how many other websites are trying to rank for this keyword? And if you want to do paid advertising, roughly how much it would cost you per click. But you can download this all into a big Excel spreadsheet. And um, essentially we have loads of keywords immediately and you can keep typing in, up, you can type in up to 10 keywords in here at one time and it will just generate loads and loads of stuff for you. So it's a really great tool. There's a link down there for you if you wanted to have a look. This is Google Trends. So when we talked about how things change, this, this was pretty much just in the last couple of weeks that we that we found this. So we work with a company who does email marketing and we actually run paid advertising for them. And we, and they were, you know, dropping in inquiries and we couldn't really, you know, there was no real rhyme or reason why, but what we discovered was actually over time, the, um, the searches for the specific terms that they were kind of really focused on, the kind of generic umbrella terms, they, they were going down at the beginning of the year, they're all the way up here. Um, and now pretty much they've almost been slashed by about two thirds. Um, and what it turned out uh, was that uh, the market's dropping a little bit, but also we've now figured out that we can actually um, look for keywords for people much earlier in the chain you know, looking for customer retention keywords. So although we were targeting email marketing before, we're now gonna target ways to retain customers for small businesses and therefore start to introduce those people who aren't aware of email marketing much yet through, you know, through that way. So we're now gonna kind of start writing content around that in a different way. So using something like Google Trends is really valuable if you're looking kind of for different ones. Matt says, how often should you update websites with new or trending keywords? So Matt, what we'd say is you need to give it a little bit of time for your for it all to settle in. And, and normally it can take, you know, three months. It can take three to six months, but you can normally you can start to get an idea if you're looking at Google Analytics, which website, which pages are ranking well. Um, if you're starting to appear on Google search results, you know, after around three to six months. So I it, the important thing is to is to review it, you know, every month, have a look. Is anything improving you know if after three to six you're not really seeing anything improving then that's when you might want to jump in and, and kind of um play around with a different uh different keyword we've got long tail keyword research which is great for informing blog content you know why is someone doing you know it, it's like typing in something like you know yeah how much does a gardener cost or what's the best um what's the difference between electric vehicle charging speeds that kind of thing Answer the Public is a really great tool for this. Um, they have a limited number of free kind of entries that you can do, I think every 24 hours or week or whatever it is. But you type in a keyword into here, a simple one, and it generates a lovely wheel like this that's kind of hard to read sometimes, but a wheel of long tail, what we call long tail, which just means long form um, questions and queries that people are, are typing in. Um, and it's really great for just um, helping uh, break down your content a little bit more. You know, we might be talking about, you know, a, um, you know, let's say the, the lemonade stand uh, example earlier online. You know, if we, if, you know, we might be talking about lemonade quite a lot, but what we don't realize is we could actually start tapping into content around, you know, um, alternatives to caffeine drinks or um, sugar-free, um, uh, new sugar-free uh, drinks or, um, you know, new uh, businesses who do, you know, 100% recycled cans or, or whatever approach you want to take. But there, are, we don't always need to focus directly on the one keyword that we um, have been targeting for the rest of our website. We might want to break down the content a little bit and try and kind of dive into a few different things. Um, the link's there or Stu has put it in the chat for you. And ideally, in the end, the best keyword, once we've looked at all our research and we've looked at all those volumes in Google Keyword Planner and stuff, the best keyword is going to be one that is has a has low competition, so not many people searching for it. Has a, sorry, not many people trying to rank for it. Has lots of people searching for it, and of course, is relevant for your content. But that's easier said than done because everyone is trying to find that the 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 kind of golden egg of keywords. But that, of course, in that lovely Venn diagram, is um, the ideal keyword. 
So now that we have our keywords, where do they go? Someone, so someone asked, asked about this in the chat, so I'm gonna run through this quite quickly, um, but we do have some, a blog on it, which will help you kind of understand it. If you wanted to check it out on the website, there'll be a link in here. So first, your page title. You need to put your, you want your keywords in your page title. And what that means is on your home page, your page title, you don't want it to be called home. You want it to be relevant to your product. You know, you want it to be, um, for us, you know, digital marketing agency in Brighton, something uh, with those keywords in mind. You know, we saw there was no coincidence that when we typed in dog sitters earlier, all the page titles there said dog sitters in Brighton or dog sitters in Hove. That is where the page title is. So page title, I'll show you where it is. Meta description, which is the little descriptive bit underneath the page title. The actual headings on your page, it's a really important place. You know, don't just put, um, you know, uh, online shop. You know, if you have an online e-commerce store, you might want to think about ways that you can include a keyword in there to help, you know, add another keyword onto that page. Your content, of course, which is obvious. Images, so giving images a keyword. It's called image alt text or alternative text. And backlink anchors as well. I'm not going to talk about that very much because it's a whole nother kettle of fish. But essentially, when someone is hyperlinking to your website, so if you have the Guardian linking to your website, the words that they're using to link are very relevant. You know, if they talk about, if, if the words they're linking are digital marketing agency Brighton and they're linking to our website with that, that tells Google um, that the Guardian is willing to confirm that we are a digital marketing agency in Brighton. Whereas if it said find out more, there aren't, aren't any keywords there. So the actual uh, words that someone uses to link to your website are relevant to. So when we talk about keywords and page titles, if you don't know where your, your page titles are, you know, open some tabs in Google and you can hover over these tabs and that will tell you that specific page, that is the page title on that page. So you can go through your website, open some, some, some of the pages up and have a look at there and it, will, and it will tell you exactly what it says. And where you change your page title, if, you don't, if you're not aware, is in WordPress, um, there's a tool called Yoast. Most uh, developers put it in already. But if you're on Squarespace or Wix, you'll see something like this. It's called an SEO section. But um, you would just type your title in where it says SEO title and you type your meta description in where it says description. And what that does is that shows you what it will look like on Google. So you can see here, let's say if it was, you know, Creative Bloom, you know, and our homepage, we might have something like digital marketing agency in Brighton, Creative Bloom, that might be our home, that might be our homepage page title. Um, and that's, and that's where you're gonna put it in there. Here's an example of one that isn't very good. So fresh time, what do they do at first glance? Absolutely no idea. Maybe they sell fresh time, um, but they don't. They are, well, they might, but it's a grocery store online that I came across. Hopefully no one owns it. I'm not slating it. Maybe some free uh, consultancy that I'm giving right now. But um, yeah, fresh time, right? Of course, there are ways, you know, how could we improve this? You know, if we know that it's an online grocery store and they've got a little bit of a med subscription, Feel free to write in the chat if you want, as I go through this, what would be a better way of writing a page title for this? If, if it, and it is their home page, so fresh time, but yeah, it's branding, but no one's really gonna click on it purely from the fact that I have no idea what it is. And also remember that if Google knows that a user won't know what it is, then Google, Google will be unlikely to um, actually uh, you know, rank you, put you among the rankings. Immediately, so Stuart said, online grocery store, Samantha said, grocery store in Hove, offering exactly. So even that is going to be better. So we've got, I've, I've put some in here, grocery store in Brighton. So me and Samantha are right on the same page. Um, and yes, you can use um, bars like that to separate the text. You can use that or you can use hyphens. Um, that's absolutely fine. It's just a, a preference in terms of whichever you prefer looks um, the best. The one thing I'd say is if you're using bars or hyphens, try and make sure you do it on every page on your website. So choose one and then run with it because then it looks nice and tidy um, if, if, if there's ever kind of uh, multiple uh, page titles popping up. And your page title should be no longer than 60 characters. So 60 characters long. If you go over it, Google's going to truncate it and chop it, chop it at the end. So all your effort, not all your effort, but some of your effort is, uh, is wasted. So 60 characters. All right. 
Any uh, little bit, any more kind of specific questions? I'll, I'll make sure I see if I have some time at the end. And a quick way for you to visually see all the pages in your website in Google. So at the moment, you, it's, you see kind of all sorts of websites. If you type the word site, S-I-T-E, with a nice colon, and then put your website address afterwards, so creativebloomrocks.com, you will just have results for your website in Google. So at a glance, you can really quickly have a look at your page titles. And what you might also find in there is you might find some pages that you think, wait, that shouldn't be on Google. I, I shouldn't have like a, um, you know, maybe a maybe it says test page or something like that that someone published ages ago by accident or maybe on purpose and forgot to remove it. But you can look at your page titles. You can look at your meta description, see how they look, see how your brand is being perceived, make sure everything's nice and cohesive. Yeah, but also any pages that maybe shouldn't be on there, you can you'll be able to find as well. And if you want to do anything a bit more technical, you can use a, a tool called Screaming Frog, which is up here. And um, they do have a free version. Um, we use it. It's a really fantastic tool, but much more data and te technical. So that's not your bag. Then, yeah, use that site tip. And then obviously we've got the description. You're editing it in the same place, that little example I gave you before. But it's really important. We can see that Google does highlight words. You know, if you type something into, into Google, a keyword, and you look at the meta description, it's often highlighting words in there. So it obviously considers it to be an important factor. So you've got, um, here's a better example of how that could be written, you know, considering all the words that Google might want to see or people are actually typing in, that could be a better kind of format. If you don't type it, it will just take a chunk from that page. So it's not the worst thing in the world. And obviously, if you have a thousand pages, we wouldn't expect you to write every single one. Just focus on your most important pages, your home page, your main services pages and that kind of thing. And you have up to 160 characters to do it in. And your shop goes from looking like this. This was fresh time before. I had no idea what it was. And now all of a sudden it's very clear what they do. So, you know, very simply, especially if you're sat among your competitors and you've, um, you know, and when we're looking at ads, it's even more important, obviously, your, your page title and description that you've got that kind of spot on. So that's page titles, meta description we've talked about. Now quickly on headers, including it in the headers is only going to benefit you. This is, there's always a bit of a compromise here between, you know, branding what you feel comfortable having on your page and also the kind of keywords that are going to help you. Um, I can guarantee you that if you went onto our website and kind of looked at a page like this, you wouldn't even clock that it says SEO agency in Brighton. You know, whereas if I said to you, oh, that's the keyword you need to have on your page, you know, other, you know, or maybe something specific, you know, if it was like wedding flower, luxury wedding flowers in Sussex, you know, someone might say, oh, I don't want that. But not many people see it. You kind of, it just kind of like blends in there. It's only because we know our business is very well that it kind of becomes an issue. But in terms of keywords, it's another signal. The next thing that Google is going to focus on is going to be your header. Um, so when we say headers, when you're when you're editing your pages, it's H1s, H2s. Those are all headers. And there, there's a hierarchy and there should only be one H1 on every page. That's what we say. Um, it's essentially the umbrella term that that page is about. So you're not going to have your main keyword in there. So for us, this page is about SEO. So it's going to be SEO agency in Brighton because that's what we want to get found for. Um, and then what we're also doing is we've done a bit of research and we know that people type in what is SEO. So we've also included on that page some information because we want to try and be an authority in our sector, especially in Brighton, actually helping people understand what it is if you don't already know. So headers is number three. And then my most annoying slide of the day, try not to stay on it for too long, Kermit the Frog, talking about content. When you're looking at your keywords, of course, naturally, if we're writing some content, keywords will come out. There'll be keywords in there. So write it naturally first. And then from our keyword research, we might have found that, oh, a, um, a keyword that we that, that users use to search for SEO is um, local SEO agency, Brian. And that might be, it could be on the same page or it could be a separate page of content. But you might find that there are specific terms that you can put into your content that maybe weren't in there before. So write it naturally. And then just double check with your keywords if there's any other keywords or a different variety or another semantic word, a keyword that's kind of related to that keyword that you could use um, afterwards. So just make sure you write it naturally and, and, it, and it's not robotic like, you know, we sell flowers in Brighton, the best flower shop in Brighton. Come and buy our flowers. They are amazing. Flowers are great, you know, because no one, it sounds like a robot and Google's not going to enjoy that. 
and a notable mention here is there's you know um architects uh, is a good example any anyone who's an architect not anyone who's an architect let me take that back a lot of the time <laughs> we come across architects who have nice simplistic they look fantastic their websites their imagery is massive however just because you want a minimal design um, you still need to rank, you still need content to rank for SEO. It's a little bit like having a bookshop without any books in it. Um, so if you if your website as a whole is very simplistic or minimal, it's important to, that can be the front end of the website. It can look like that if that's how you want it to be. But it's really important to break down your content somewhere behind the scenes so that there is some stuff in there. Um, a really important thing, making sure, yeah, as Stu said, you, you really want at least around 200 to 300 words on your pages, even your kind of like uh, main services page, pages, you need some content on there. Um, otherwise, it is essentially like an empty shop in Google's eyes. And I think last but not least, image images. So I said image alt text. So very quickly, this is just some examples. This is WordPress here. This is Squarespace, this is Wix. Obviously there are other website builders that some people might have their websites built in, but I just wanted to give some examples. So these are all the places to put keywords in your images. It's a good way of appearing on Google images. Um, you know, if you sold wedding flowers and you want to appear for kind of, you know, rose wedding bouquet or something like that, you might want to put it in there. Um, and you can lose longer tails, so be more descriptive. You know, if, if it's an e-commerce website, making sure you're, this is really important for e-commerce as well um you know any ways to free you know get your images popping up all over the place um it's called alt text on wordpress it's called uh, the caption on squarespace and it's called what's in this image on wix because all these website builders love to confuse us by giving us lots of different terminology okay and la and the last section for seo is some notable mentions now i'm going to fly through this so i have enough time to cover the ppc so bear with me, but like I say, you will get these slides and you'll get a recording of this, so you'll be able to review it if you need to. So backlinks, that's what we talked about for very briefly. If one website is pointing to your website. It's a great um, a signal for authority and it's gonna improve your authority if you have some, the more, the more high value backlinks you have. And when I say high value, I mean from established, trustworthy websites like The Guardian, for example. And what they do, is there essentially a way of, sub, uh, of a website essentially saying to Google, hi Google, I, an established website, approve this website over here. And the more of those websites you have doing that, obviously the more Google says, wow, this is a really great website, we're gonna rank you higher. So that's what a backlink is. I'm not gonna cover it anymore because it's very, very it's a whole nother uh, session. Um, but if that's something that's interest, if, if, if you've done everything else, it's, it's something that you should um, look at or look at potentially thinking about how you can improve the amount of links you have to your website because it improves your authority. Your speed, so website speed, and it's gonna come, become more and more important, particularly on mobile. Um, you can use any of these tools down here. So you can type in GT metrics speed test, you can type in Pingdom speed test or think with Google speed test and you'll be able to put your URL in and see how fast your website is. Um, it is quite cutthroat on these, so don't worry if it says F or you have a horrible score. Um, it's just something to be aware of. And if you struggle with your, you know, if, if you have a, um, a slow website, there are ways you can improve it. Very typically it's images. So images that aren't compressed, they're typically massive and, and they take a long time to, to, to load. And as we add content to our website over time, the number of images on the website increase over time and then it slows down the website. So but paying attention to this and paying attention to, you know, mobile uh, speed particularly is really important. You know, when we're talking about mobile speed, you want to really be below three seconds, below two seconds for a page to load. This is the type of thing it might pop up and say, you need to do these things. A developer can help you if you're not aware. But like I say, very typically, it's about images. So compressing images. And as Stu threw into the chat, there is a, a URL called tinypng. Uh, which is somewhere you can just compress the images. It doesn't change the quality of them. You just drag them in there, it makes them a bit smaller, and then you can put them on your website. And there are also a way, there is also um, plugins that developers can put on that automatically reduce the size of uh, the images on your site, but I think it might cost a little bit. Um, Lisa, not so much. That's something that you, you might, have to, might have to talk about um, after in terms of media library. 
So um, I don't think it's in your CMS. So I don't think it's going to be, uh, I don't think that it's loading the media library every time it's browsing the website. So I would say, no, it doesn't affect um, the speed. It's only the ones that are physically on the website. And good image sizes, I now say below 300 kilobytes. So it used to be 100, but images, cameras are getting better. And, you know, and, and I think that it, it, it would be reasonable to say if you can get images below 300 kilobytes. So if you don't compress them, they're going to be like 1.2 megabytes. They're going to be massive. And if you drag it into tiny PNG, it will drop down. And the other thing is, if you can convert it from a PNG to a JPEG, it will almost half or, uh, or reduce it by about three times just automatically because PNGs are larger. So if you compress the images, they shouldn't, they shouldn't blur some. And if you drag it into tiny PNG, if you try that, you should see it, download it and compare the two. One will be smaller than the other and they should look the same. Um, this, it's different um, compressing versus resizing. So we're not resizing the images, we're compressing it. So see, see what it does. So we talked about mobile, so mobile speed, but also mobile optimization. Okay, Google is now looking at mobile first. So everyone should be um, grabbing their phones and having a look at their, their website on a mobile, making sure it doesn't look like this, really tiny and just like a web, normal website on a desktop, but actually is optimized for it. Um, Wix does it automatically. Square, no, uh, does it? Squarespace does it automatically. Wix is still drag and drop. And um, WordPress obviously it depends on the template you're using or the, or the developer, but make sure you have a look. And that means really go through the whole journey, you know, at every step. Does anything look kind of out of whack? Um, keep an eye on that, it's really important. Don't keyword stuff, be natural. We already talked about that. So don't just write loads and loads of keywords and chuck it in a paragraph, write something natural um, so people can read it. Avoid duplicate content, so no copy and pasting. I don't really ideally want you to copy, um, you know, uh, one website said all of this and you kind of copy 500 words from their website and copy and paste it onto yours. Avoid duplicate content. We said unique content is king. So whenever you can, as much as you can, make sure you are writing your own content because Google doesn't like to be confused. And there is a link here. If you ever want to check that Google is going to think that you're... Um, content is a plagiarized so it's a really good thing and for blogs as well if you're using resources and that kind of thing taking um, snippets put it through a, um, a, a play, plagiarism checker and um, just to make sure that you're not kind of putting it on there and 404 like we said we don't want to be sending google down a dead end you know a 404 just means a broken page so very um typically it's it's when maybe you've um turned a page uh, your pay, a page is once live on your website and then you've um, put it into your drafts again, but you haven't uh, redirected that URL. That's what we call it. So that URL can still be found, but there's nothing on the page. So you arrive at something like this. Um, and it's OK if you crawl your website and you find some. You just need to make sure you redirect them um, or just make sure there aren't any uh, 404s in there. And you can use Screaming Frog, like we said, like the tool we used it for, for before. To do that, and lastly, just to remind you once more, it's very important to, to, to not just go from an outside, to, to be have an inside out perspective, you wanna have an outside in. So be very honest, step back, um, be critical and look at your websites, criticize them, but then also be willing to kind of criticize some things on your own website and be very honest. Um, and it's not all about saying, I am great. <laughs> And one thing that Stu and I always say as well is SEO is not just a quick, you know, 100 meter sprint. It is a marathon. You know, you're not going to do all these things and think, ah, oh, there you are, finished. You know, there will still be things that keep changing. You know, we said earlier that everything is continuously moving and changing when it comes to search marketing. So making sure that you um, are always doing some keyword research, you're learning, you know, you're looking at the Google environment, how it's changing. Check it after three to six months. Have a look at what's going on. If, if you're not seeing any positive results, you might need to add some more content or maybe you're targeting the wrong keywords or that kind of thing. And there is a blog on our website on how to add on-page SEO um, if you need to go through that process again. And that's just going through page titles, choosing the keyword, headers, um, content, that kind of thing, and where to put your keywords. Okay, so I am 
running four minutes over time. So that's pretty good because that's a lot to get through. And I appreciate that with SEO, there are so many, you know, we could normally probably run a session on, on, on each section individually. So, but immediately that should give you some actionable things that you can go away straight away and check, go onto your website, run speed tests, do some keyword research, look at the Google environment. So you can do that immediately. So hopefully that was valuable. Now we're going to talk through AdWords PPC and we're going to focus first on these lovely offers that they give you. And I would love to say be wary because there are, we, you know, we've worked with businesses who've taken advantage of this free ad credit. But remember what I said, your credit card is on file. So as soon as that budget is used, your, uh, the money from your um, credit card uh, starts getting spent if you don't know what you're doing. So all I would say is, you know, be very, just, just be cautious if, if Google's offering you, let's say you've just signed up to your keyword research um, and they've asked you to put your card in, you know, they will send you this kind of thing and just be wary to jump in and use it straight away because we have been in a situation where people have been spending their own money before without even realizing it. Um, it's a bit cheeky on Google's behalf. So just make sure you know what you're doing or someone at least is checking it or keeping an eye on, on it if you are taking advantage of some of this free ad credit, which does exist if um, it is something you're interested in. I'd also say that when you start a Google Ads account, it will typically start it up in something called Google AdWords Express. And that is um, essentially a very, very simplistic form of using Google AdWords. And in my opinion, it's a way of Google being a bit more vague about where they're sh showing your ads. And it's really important that we know where our ads are being shown. We get as much information as possible. We can change as many factors of targeting factors as we can. So making sure you're on the real Google AdWords platform and not on Google AdWords Express. And you'll typically see it in your navigation URL. Um, but if you do have a Google Express account, there is a link down here in terms of how to switch it from Google Express to Google AdWords. Um, if, if you are in that situation. All right. So why do we want Google Ads? So there are around 70 to 80,000 Google searches every second, right? So if we can, and we know from doing Google searches and just from seeing it every day, that ads appear right at the top, right? We see them right at the top of the Google searches. And this is a little just snapshot about how ads have changed over the years. You know, from 2000, we can see visually how different and how almost disguised they are now compared to you know where they used to be they used to be tiny but also you know bright blue you know writing in bold with highlighted text behind it and everything said sponsored link but now it's pretty much blended in to an organic result which means more people are now clicking on ads because not as many people as we think can you know notice an ad from an organic result you know, uh, there's now four ads that can appear in the top of the results. It used to be three um, and they're now much larger. So we can see that on our uh, desktop screens and our laptop screens, um, our whole page can be taken up of ads before we even see any res you know, results. Um, they really do blend in um, to organic results. And these are some reasons you might be interested in Google Ads. So you can be at the top of Google until your organic improves. So you might have a new website and uh, you might identify that you want to rank highly for something, um, but your organic results aren't quite there yet. So if you want to rank at the top, Google Ads is a way that you could get there. You can target specific keywords and locations. So you can, only, you can uh, choose to only target people in a specific geographic area if you want, and you can be quite accurate if you know what you're doing. You can steal your competitor traffic, which is fantastic. You can actually bid on your competitor keywords and you can appear when someone types in your competitor's brand name. Um, uh, Google is trying to kind of crack down on that a little bit and we're talking about relevancy because of relevancy um, it's harder to do this because obviously most brand names we don't have on our own websites so um, but that is a way you can do it and um, you can use display ads so even when people aren't on Google you can do put, put banners up around websites online you can choose to only pay when someone clicks on your ad so a lot of people forget that uh, um, most of the results that we see, those ads, they're only getting charged when someone clicks on it. Um, you can set it up um, to work differently, but the majority of ads are called CPC, which is cost per click or PPC, pay per click ads. You can use them for awareness, attracting new customers. 
You can remarket to people who've already been on your website. We'll talk about that uh, in a few slides. And uh, you can obviously offer seasonal holiday offers um, and that kind of thing as well. So you can do product offerings. But dude, be careful because like I said before, this is paid advertising. Our cards are listed. If we don't necessarily know what we're doing, we could be spending money unnecessarily. We could be being way too broad with our searches. And these are all some things you need to be aware of. So it can be really expensive if you don't do your keyword research. You know, um, I know that some of those email marketing terms that we were targeting, they were £54 a click. So 54 quid is what, what people like MailChimp were willing to, um, to pay just to get people onto their website, which is absolutely ludicrous when you think about it. Now, when we're talking about keywords and ads, um, really with Google, we're normally going to be looking between one pound, two pound, that kind of thing. But for those hyper competitive um, agencies, they're willing to spend, you know, that much money every month. So being aware of um, bidding on expensive keywords without doing your research, you don't want to rinse your budget. Um, you know, if you're not kind of if no one's paying attention to how much you're spending every week, you could just be spending your money um, and then suddenly jump in three weeks later and realize you spent 500 pounds and have nothing to show for it. So important not to rinse your budget. You don't want to appear for non-relevant keywords or broad keywords. You have to have conversion tracking. There is no point paying for advertising if we haven't worked out if they're leading to conversions. And we will talk about conversions. We need to write good ads. Um, we need to understand our budgeting. And we need our landing pages. And that is the page that we send someone to on our website. They need to be as good as possible. There's no point sending, you know, paying for someone to come to our website if it's not ready. You know, or the page isn't good, or if it's a bit, you know, slow, or the mobile um, optimization isn't good. And I always like to remind people that it is not always the answer. Even if someone comes to me and says, um, you know, I want to, I want to run PPC ads, it doesn't, or it's not relevant for every business, and it's not always going to be the what the golden goose for you. Um, don't just push the button across your fingers. You know, it could be already incredibly competitive, or you could be targeting the wrong customers, or they're just not the uh, the customers clicking that you want to so we always say if you want to do it run a trial first have a very have a much smaller budget see what happens um see what's out there get some data you know work on you know we'll be able to find out what keywords people are typing in and what is causing them to click through and then make a decision after that so when we talk about google ads so these are the these are the options that we have search display shopping video and apps um, we're going to focus on search and display today, mainly on search because we're talking about search marketing. But obviously, we do see Google Shopping popping up on search as well. So you will see e-commerce products popping up. But again, that's kind of another kettle of fish. So we're going to focus on search and display today. And we all know what they look like. So if you had a donkey sanctuary, we can see that people are bidding on donkey sanctuary ads. Um, if you had a Marmite shop, I'm not sure what it is. I just typed it in and it, and people are bidding on, on the words Marmite shop. Um, and it's also important to note that in that local map pack where we saw um, the Google My Business pages appearing like this, you can connect that to your Google Ads so that when someone's looking locally, you can actually have your ad. This is an example of one here. Um, I should have really screenshot the whole thing, but um, you can actually connect it so your ads are appearing in there. In the local map pack so there is a that's, that's a kind of good way to use ads i think if you're a local business or selling a service in a specific location but i but essentially with search ads your ads appear when a user searches for a specific keyword that you are targeting in your account and when we talk about display ads these are the ones that appear on other websites around the place. Um, display ads is the kind of things that we'd be more likely to use for remarketing. So when someone's visited our website and left, we might wanna send them some discounts on some other websites or that kind of thing. But you're gonna treat it like an online billboard. So it's a little bit like when we walk down the street um, and you look you know, to your left and the right and there's some billboards, it's essentially the same thing. So um, AdWords auction and relevancy. So what's happening in the background? I'm just gonna quickly tell you what's happening in the background. So obviously these have been decided in terms of what order they're in. You know, we've got digital marketing institute number one, jellyfish number two, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a reason that they're in this order. And I'm just gonna give you a very kind of top uh, line explanation of why. Um, and typically display ads are much cheaper than um, 
search ads, Lisa, because you are uh, essentially showing it to people when they're not searching for it. But um, yeah, with search ads, it's because it's a in in market customer, so someone who's searching for something specifically at that time, it's much more competitive. Um, so you will, yeah, it will be uh, much cheaper to use display. It's only, I mean, to give you a rough figure, it's only like 20 pence or something per click, 20 to 40 pence. So the reason, so one of the main factors that Google's looking at is something that we call quality score. And that is relevancy. So it, it just simply is relevancy made up of a combination of different things. So it's how relevant is the content on your website to the keyword that you're trying to target? How relevant is the ad to the key that you've written to the keyword you're trying to target? You know, how many, you know, while you've had your ads running, how many people have clicked it? And how many people who click those ads kind of stay on your website or leave straight away? And all of that, Google is using um, its algorithms to give you what we call a quality score out of 10. And it will give you that for all the keywords you're targeting, each individual one. So you might have 10 out of 10 if it's a really, um, if it's like your umbrella keyword, like if it's uh, create, if a brand name, for example, Creative Bloom, you probably have 10 out of 10 because it's, it's going to be hyper relevant. But if you're going for something a little bit uh, more vague, then you might have a lower quality score. And so how does it decide what quality score to give you? Um, and how does it decide um, where it's gonna rank people? So essentially, it's looking at your bid. Um, it's then gonna look at your ad relevancy. And then it's going to look at your landing page relevancy. So everyone is able to bid on a keyword. We can bid a maximum what we call cost per click. So I'm only willing to bid about two pounds per click um, for people to come through. And then you know, I've written my ad really relevant and I've got my landing page really relevant and I've got a quality score of X. So let's see some examples. So let's say we have, we'll call him middle bidder and he's willing to bid five pounds, right? But he only has a quality score of six out of 10 because it's out of 10. So he's kind of in the mid range of being relevant. And then we have an, a low bidder who's only willing to bid three pounds, but they have a really relevant website of nine out of 10. And then we have a high bidder who is very is not relevant at all, but is willing to bid a lot more. The point of this um, very simplistic kind of um, example of the algorithm is that just because you're able to bid more does not mean that you're going to be able to rank higher because Google cares about relevancy. So this is where we talked about SEO really helping your cost per click and the amount that ads are going to cost you. The more relevant your site is, we can see here. Um, this person's only having to, you know, only having to bid three pounds essentially, but um, they're in second place over someone who's maybe willing to bid eight, but because they haven't worked on their relevancy. So it's important to um, uh, make sure we're optimizing our, our, our pages. And this is why, you know, you don't just jump into ads straight away and start marketing them. You need to work on your relevancy, jump on site, um, do your work on keyword research and make sure sending someone to a page that is very relevant for the keyword you're trying to target. I've shown you a little snapshot of, of the data table that you'll typically see in Google Ads. Um, and I've also given you a handy jargon busting slide in a few slides time that kind of explain what all these topics are up here, all these individual headings. But this is how we, we typically see what we call keywords. You know, we've got a cost per click per keyword. So this is how much we're willing to bid on that keyword. And then we can see our quality score here. So we can see at 10, and uh, we can see some a little bit lower and then we can see why as well, because, you know, these are much more targeted to our business, whereas we've gone a little bit broader with Best Yoga Retreats UK. And uh, so our quality score is a, a little bit less. But what we can see here is actually um, with quality score, if you have a low quality score, there are ways that you can improve it. So how do you do it? You can improve um, ad keywords from your um ad group into your ad. So make sure you actually have the keywords in the ads that you've written. Make sure your keywords are actually on your landing pages. I know it sounds obvious, but make sure that the keywords you're trying to target, if they, if you can include them on your page. Uh, semantic keywords. So keywords that are linked to the keywords you're targeting should be on your page. So Google likes to know that the content in general is including all the stuff it expects to find in, to, in regards to kind of keywords. Making sure your experience is better on your landing page, like mobile optimization and uh, speed and that kind of thing. And then you'll get nice thumbs up and a, an improved uh, quality score. 
So when we're targeting keywords, so we're focusing on this section here, Google will ask you, right, which keywords do you want to target when you're setting up your account? And you'll see there's different ways that these have been put in place. So there's some with speech marks around them, some with square bars, and some with little pluses, and they all mean different things. It's essentially telling Google how you want to target these keywords. And it's, um, you can see them here. This is the type of uh, interface that you might put it into. And when you're looking at speech marks and square bars and that kind of thing, it's all different ways of saying, right, this is how broad you want to be with your targeting. So I've given you a nice table here so you can see. So when we look at these square bars, that's called exact match. And exact match keywords is essentially saying this is pretty much all I'm willing for someone to type in to target for this keyword. So um, in this instance, someone's typing in women's hats. I only want to appear if they type in exactly that term, so women's hats. If we use speech marks, it would be phrase match for the word women's hat. So it means we could appear for something like buy women's hats or secondhand women's hats because it's in the phrase. So you've got exact match, that's exactly that term, phrase match within the phrase. And then you've got things called broad match, broad match modifier. And these are going to be um, extinct next year in June 2022. And you'll only be able to focus on these two. But um, for now, you don't need to worry about the top one because you don't, no one's ever going to be using this anymore. Um, broad match modifier, you put a little plus between each word. And it helps give you kind of like, it helps you appear for synonyms, uh, mis uh, other uh, misspellings and um, kind of close variations to what you're looking for. So women's hats, hats for women, it would probably appear for um, hats for ladies, hats for girls, that kind of thing, because Google knows and can understand that women is related to those terms. So those are the different types and you can see them. This is how where you'd input them, but that's essentially all those mean. And to start with, you know, if you, if you um, know your, uh, if, if you don't really know what to be targeting or whatever, of course, we can use broad match to find, let Google throw a bigger net out there and see what people type in. But that's when we risk appearing for broader, less relevant keywords. So we just need to be wary with those things. Right, so I've got kind of six minutes. So I'm going to try and whistle through these. Digital shop window very quickly. So we can see an ad here um, that Eon has used. Um, and you can use something called negative keywords, which is when you um, choose which keywords you don't want to appear for. And it's very important because obviously they're appearing for this brand, Eon Clothing. Um, so they would need to add a negative keyword as Eon Clothing as an exact match because they don't want their ad to appear for that because it's irrelevant. You don't want someone clicking on there if, they, if they're um, are not, not uh, the right customer. And it's also important, these are both some bad examples of ads. You should not be including in an advert what you don't do. So they've added not serving prom or school dancing in this ad that I, that, that I managed to find. So don't use an ad to say what you don't do. Use an ad to say what you do do really well. Um, it's quite a funny one. And then a funny one. So this is quite clever. So Samsung have actually bid on the word iPhone 6. Obviously, iPhones and Apple products, but they've said, oh, that's all good. You obviously meant you wanted an S6 from Samsung. So they're trying to nick some of their competitors' traffic. So that's quite a clever one. But the one thing I'd say with ads is, you know, for the, in this example, I've typed in bakery course online. You know, have a look at what makes you click on an ad. You know, what is it? What's the wording? How does the wording make you feel? You know, in terms of um, psychology, you know, look, this one actually, they've just introduced um, images into ads now, so you can add them in. That actually does make a difference. It draws my eye to that ad. So being, you know, taking um, the time to kind of focus on actually what draws your eye and what actually makes you want to click on an ad is really important. Very quickly on budgets, Google is going to ask you how much do you want to spend each day? And the way that you work that out is you work out your monthly spend first. So how much do you want to spend over a month? So let's say you want it to be 500 pounds. Um, you will then be able to work out from that your daily spend. So it's important. We've done our research. We know how much our rough cost per click is going to be. Let's say one pound. So we know if we have 500 pounds a month and our clicks are going to be roughly one pound on average, then we hopefully get around 500 clicks. And so to work out that daily budget that we just saw, we've got our monthly spend 500 pounds and we divide it by the days in the month on average. So 500 divided by 30.2, which is the average across the year, 
um, would be 1650. So that is your daily budget, essentially. So you work out your monthly, divide it by um, 30.2. And that's only if you're running it on every day. If you're running it on every day of the month, obviously, it will change if you turn it off for weekends. Um, and there is your daily budget. I have about two more minutes. So let me just um, see how long I've got a couple more slides. Yeah, I think we'll be right. Perfect. So um, let's move out of the way. Remarketing quickly. Someone mentioned this the other day um, when uh, Stu was running his session on Tuesday about remarketing. So what remarketing is, is essentially when someone comes to your website and then leaves, you can then serve them adverts. And it's great for uh, people who leave carts, who um, put something in checkout and they don't complete. You could then send someone a free delivery uh, ad and they could click on it. Or it, should, it could show them a code um, and that kind of thing. But it's a good way to kind of retain customers who may, you may maybe lost or who may be kind of still in the kind of decision phase. It's a good way to kind of remind them. And there's a little kind of visual infographic of the example. You have a customer, they go to your website, they're trapped with a cookie, then they leave, and then you can kind of advertise them on advertise them on other websites. And what that does is it creates audiences. So you can actually choose specific pages for this to be applied to. So you can say, right, just for anyone who visits my website, I want to create an audience. And once it gets to a certain size, you'll be able to advertise to them. So you can see here it says too small to serve because it needs to be over a thousand to um, serve it on search ads. And this is a little bit of like what it looks like. So, you know, so you might have just gone onto this website, Gazelle, and now you've gone to, onto YouTube and you're suddenly seeing these big ads. That is what remarketing is. So you're seeing that kind of in, in action. And lastly, don't forget about conversions. If you're running any advertising or SEO, it's really important to set up conversions. And that just means assigning um, a conversion trigger or just saying, um, choosing what conversions are on your website. That could be a form fill, someone signing up to your email letter, someone clicking on a button, visiting a page, but, or, you know, buying a product, of course, if it's e-commerce, having those conversions in place is so important to understand ROI, you know, your return on ad investment, but also understand, you know, which of your pages, landing pages are, are bringing conversions, uh, which of your SEO um, efforts are working. You know, this is now, you might have a thank you page like this. So once someone bought something or, you know, filled out a form, you could very simply put um, a conversion on anyone who visits this page. And then you know that wherever they came from um, led to a conversion. As I said, all of these um, phrasings up here, all these different words, I've given you a handy jargon busting slide to tell you what they all mean if you don't know and if you're banging your head against the table like the kitty down there. Um, and the final thing to remember is reporting. So you should all have analytics, Google Analytics. It's free. It's a free tool on your website um, that tracks everything that's going on, which pages are working, how people are enjoying it, um, if you've got major issues and which of your kind of marketing efforts are, are you know, bearing fruit. So using that is really important. There are paid tools that you can use as well if you want to go a bit more advanced, but regardless, everyone should have, have Google Anal Analytics installed on their website. So that is the end of the search marketing session. I appreciate there was loads in there, but there's a couple more sessions obviously coming up. Um, so next week we have uh, social media and content and data security and GDPR on the 21st, so put your place. It's all on the Eventbrite pages. Um, so feel free to go check those up. Out. And just to remind you about the digital champion. So I said there was a form at the end of this. If you haven't seen this already, um, you'll get these slides, but there is a contact form here to request uh, your preferred digital support. Um, and they'll kind of direct you to the right uh, digital champion. Um, so you give them some details or you can give them a call and leave a message and, uh, and, and they'll get in touch with you. But it's free eight hours of free consultancy um, that you don't have to pay for um, from some really, really great um, experts in, in you know, loads of different um, areas of digital. And uh, so definitely take advantage of that. I've thrown a couple helpful resources in here. Um, and yeah, thank you. There's one last cat because you stayed till the end. You get to see the cutest one of all. So, yeah, I appreciate that we are, are we on time? Yeah, bang on we 1.30. Are, just on that's, time that's just, just much, spot on. 
no problem. So does anyone have, obviously, if anyone needs to go, feel free, but I think we got five minutes just to cover any any burning questions. And I, there's obviously some digital champions in here as well um, that um, would be able to give some, some valuable insights if anyone has any questions. I didn't have a chance to read the chat as I went, but I saw, I saw Stu feverishly button bashing to answer everyone. So I didn't need to interfere. So if you did ask, answer, ask a question, I didn't answer it. <laughs> I apologize while I was doing it, but um, feel free to ask now if there's anything anything that I haven't covered or anything you need clarification on. Yes, definitely. No, first off, thanks. It's been really, uh, it's really useful. Um, I've written down loads of notes to go through. So I've yeah, really sorry good. about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, as I say, I make um, rose lemonade um, and I've noticed I've done a couple of the searches you've been talking about, and I know there's a lot of volume for pink lemonade, for example. Um, I don't, I ideally want to change the name of the lemonade. I don't mind calling it pink rose lemonade. I know when it's been on television, a lot of people are, pink, are, are Googling Sam's pink lemonade, for example. I will, will, if someone was to search pink rose lemonade, and this is getting complicated, mm -hmm. or rose pink lemonade, would there be too much variation, or is that? A really serious difference and i'll have to make a serious decision on i mean so so in terms of the order of keywords so so you can typically type that into google and you'll see the difference so you'll see you can you can do that research yourself just by typing it in it will it will differ um but i would say marginally with such a specific product there you know pink rose lemonade you know i i think most people will go with either rose lemonade or pink lemonade there's not normally using both keywords what i would say is when we talked about um, adding some content to your site, that isn't always necessarily that exact keyword. You know, you could start writing a little, having a little content hub all around pink lemonade, and you could talk about all the different types and how you know how fresh lemonade, pink lemonade is different to sparkling, and then you know start to link to your products. You know, hyperlinking pink lemonade. So you're trying to essentially start it's not kind of the forefront of your business. So when someone lands, it doesn't say just pink lemonade, um, but you are starting to create some content around it because it's what we need to do sometimes. We need to kind of like dabble in areas that maybe wouldn't have been the, the ways that we would have done it, but so that we can say to Google, we actually do have content on pink lemonade. And if someone types it in, it's gonna be relevant for our searches. Um, the only thing is pink lemonade is a different product to what I imagine as uh, an American pink lemonade is a different product to the product that you're selling. So it's working out of those people who are typing that in, are they actually looking for the fresh, still, you know, fr um, pink lemonade, or are they open to the product that you're selling? Because we don't want you, we don't want you to spend hours and days working on that if the customer isn't right. So that's what I would say. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Cool. I've got a question. Uh, I've got a question for Malcolm. Malcolm's our uh, e-commerce expert. Um, Malcolm, what would you say, you know, f f from your experience, I, I'm generalizing, what would you say is the most important search strategy, well, search elements to pay attention to for an e-commerce business? Um, I know it depends on the sector and the things that um that's quite an open question. And it is, <laughs> that's why I asked it. <laughs> um I mean, first of all, I'd say that today's session has been brilliant. There's some really good, uh, you know, practical um, knowledge and information. Um, the on-site SEO is super important for mm. e-commerce. Um, I think the the tip about alt, alt tags for images often gets overlooked. Yeah. Um, so on-page SEO and really making sure that, uh, you know, pages are ranking as well as they can um, is probably my go-to bit of advice paid is a different channel altogether so paid search for me is is a very well, i think for, for for any business you've got seo that works over here giving us organic results that's great yeah. we can do what we can to get all of that free traffic through paid has some very specific targets associated to it not just in terms of revenue but in terms of activities um and actions that you're looking for a user to take once they visit your website so 
for me, they're I mean they're very different disciplines, and and often you'll, you you can be looking for different things as a result from both uh, you know from both paid and organic search. I don't know whether that helps answer your question in any way. It did yeah, that was good. Thanks. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, guys, that um, we actually worked with Malcolm not long ago, um, and we did a lot of work with Malcolm on our SEO. And um, one of the things that you mentioned just then, Malcolm, was about um, our descriptions of our products. Um, and actually, a few months down the line now, we're coming up organically as well as the manufacturers of those products and sometimes people buy off us instead of buying off the actual manufacturers thinking that we are the manufacturer so yeah oh we're doing really well on that great stuff jeff that's really good to hear that's a good success story good work malcolm <laughs> oh get him yes, yeah okay cool any other questions before we um stop the oh we need to do the poll actually don't we i'm so glad that i remembered that did I do the poll in the beginning? I don't no, we think. didn't. <laughs> we missed the poll. All right, well, we'll do the poll anyway. I was so caught up in the excitement that I uh, missed it. Okay, both it. bits now. So, <laughs> yeah. So right, Stu and I will just go on at the beginning and do another poll, and they'll just we'll make sure we're right not at all at the beginning. <laughs> um, okay, let's relaunch the poll. There we go. So feel free. So type type in there for me. Just click. You can click on the actual text itself. Um, not at all. Could be better or confident. How confident are you in understanding search marketing now? Um, whatever you feel after that session. Um, if you do need some more help, like we say, there are digital champions in here. There's eight hours of free session, a free kind of consultancy with them that you can use. Um, so make sure you uh, take advantage of that. Perfect. I have a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So I've noticed on um, a lot of brand websites, particularly fashion, they're putting lots of writing at the top and then putting the rest of it under a um, concertina. With someone like Google, uh, sorry, Google with someone like Apple or a, a other luxury uh, brands, they're not doing that and still getting at the top of Google. Mm -hmm. I know you were saying earlier about how you don't you don't want lots of images well i find that people do spend an awful lot of time looking at images i didn't say i didn't say there shouldn't be images it depends on the sector very very much okay. so um so it, i mean it could be like i was saying an example of wedding flowers uh, that that sector is going to be all about images everyone wants to see what the wedding bouquet looks like so it it's going to vary and, you, and, and it's about looking at your sector and looking at your competitors, who's ranking well and what is that makeup of content, you know, how much of it is text and imagery. Um, but we do have to also bear in mind that Apple, they don't need to do a thing because <laughs> they are such a huge website. Essentially, it would probably be one of the worst websites to keep an eye on in terms of SEO best practice, just purely because only from the fact that they are such a huge website and they have they have a domain rank, rate, rating of probably 100, that um, it'd be better to look in your sector at who's ranking well, why are they ranking well, and then try and replicate their best practices that they're doing. That would be my best bet, so. Well, that, that's my next point, really. R really, everyone's new in this sector. No one's ever really sold online before. Like, as I say, it wasn't really practical before lockdown. So it's, it's everything is very new. Some of the websites, mm -hmm you would expect from big companies are ropey at best sometimes yeah um and so it's quite hard to to get to gauge it i've been looking at other industries to kind of um you know figure it out but i'm finding it quite i'm finding that particularly frustrating mm. everyone yeah. about how they're gauging everyone else but i've got no one to gauge against yeah i would say i mean i would say in that case try and find a similar um a similar product that's maybe a different type of keyword you know, whether it's something that's like ginger beer, for example, or something that's going to be a similar type of style of product, see how that sector's all laid out, see what people are looking at there. And you can maybe be the first one in your, you know, hold the, you know, carry the baton and start kind of like going in your sector and, and be the first one to, to set, set the, um, uh, you know, the foundations and what it should be. So, yeah, it's a bit of an unknown, but only through kind of trial and error, doing some things, try, check it after three, six months. And then if it's working, then great. If it's not, then revisit it, I'd say. Uh, so, uh, folks, you know, California, you have usually done everything. <laughs> so you can usually find a website of what you do in California. So just type in, in California and you usually find something and they're usually uh, a bit ahead of us. So you know, we, mm. we often go a little bit of a website, website inspiration hunting in 
in California. Okay, thanks. Right, I've got this afternoon sorted already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. We pushed something. We pushed your call out the way, didn't we? We <laughs> gave you a big, gave you a bigger importance now to jump on. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, Matt just said, do bullet points work as well as normal text? As my sector bullet points are becoming very popular. Um, Malcolm did say, Sam, look into SIP, SUP, and Folkingtons. Um, Bullet points are, are, are still are, are still going to be super valuable. I mean, they're um, when we talk about something like a featured snippet, a lot of the times they're actually populated as 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 bullet points. Um, so again, it depends what exactly it is you're talking about. Um, but very com it's very common that bullet points are often complemented by longer form text. So having a bit of both is normally a, a good idea, and not just kind of having just bullet points on the page. We want to probably see a little bit of both, even if it's product descriptions. I wonder if Malcolm would agree, but um, normally you'd want bullet points as well as probably uh, some longer form content as well. You know, don't as don't well. bullet points kill kittens, Ollie. Unfortunately they do. That was, <laughs> shouldn't be saying that in my presentation. All right. Okay, chaps. <laughs> I think we will have to um, uh, wrap up the session. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone. Don't forget to sign on to um, the next courses next week. Um, they are going to be some really great ones around social media and GDPR. So if you haven't already, jump onto that and uh, yeah, see you then. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Really great yeah. session. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, well done, guys. See you later. See you later. Oh. oh, that was good.